even, I've never met anyone who's not into music. Maybe one person over the course of my life who said they're into music, I remember being like, wait, what? Um, but I think just growing up, hearing it around, my mom would play music while she was getting ready or while she was uh, cleaning the house. Um, I don't know, it, music's, music's like always been there for everyone, right? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, a good point. Uh, and hopefully, and it, it, there's a lot of evidence to back that up, given the amount of people who enjoy coming on the podcast and, and you know, no matter what, what kind of field they're in, whether they're from the world of sports or from the world of like business, you know, everybody tends to have a certain taste in music. Um, how big a role does it play in your life, music? I don't know that um, music is like my... <laughs> I don't want to insinuate that like I'm like some big time musician. I mean, I do have some songs and I enjoy making music, but um, in terms of my professional life, it's not a huge part of my professional life, um, but a part of my day to day. I mean, I listen to music every day, whether indirectly or not. What uh, bands and artists have you really been enjoying kind of throughout, especially this lockdown season? Oh, no. and, um, a lot of Sam Smith. Um, I've been listening to Adele. Um, I've been listening to Erica Badu. I went back to her live album um, and started listening to that. And that's just what I've been, and oh, and Nars Barkley. As a general rule, I almost always listen to music on headphones. I actually use my phone on headphones. Like, I never use my phone when it's not on headphones, rarely. Uh, maybe in the first thing in the morning, I can't find my headphones, but I have these little earbuds that I put in. They're called Galaxy Buds from Samsung, and I put them in and I listen to them. And, and I listen to music every time I, pretty much every time I leave the house, I'm listening to music. Sometimes I'm in the house alone. It's hard when you're by yourself in the house, with a, when you're in the house with the people, because if I'm wearing these earbuds, sometimes my partner or my roommate will be talking to me and I will not realize they're talking to me because I have these earphones in. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I think sadly these days, uh, it, it's kind of, it's almost like you wouldn't, you know, there's no other option other than, uh, other than us listening alone, but there is that sense with music that um, you can engage with an album or, or, or with a song more fully if, if you've just got, got the headphones on and there are no distractions yeah. around you. Even though obviously music's like very important for uh, for partying, going to gigs and stuff like that. For example, me and um, Jacob bonded over Megan Thee Stallion's album, Good News. And we just like kind of listened to like a few songs together and then kind of did our own things. And like listen to them on our own time and then got back together and had like a chat about like what we felt listening to her album. Probably good news is a really great album if you all have not listened to it yet. Is is that, when, when did Megan Thee Stallion release that? Good news was maybe two months ago, maybe more. It was pretty recent. It, yeah. It was pretty recent. Cause I'd listened to Fever, I think. Um, and I, 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 yeah, I still need to listen to it to good news. Yeah, I'm looking to see when good news was released. Um, but yeah, it was it was pretty it was in terms of music, it was it was after WAP for sure. Yeah, that was a huge, a huge record. And in terms yeah. of in terms of uh Sam Smith, what what stuff have you been listening to by him? His more recent stuff. Well, I believe Sam Smith uses they them pronouns, but I was using I was listening to it's okay. I was listening to um, um, Sam Smith. Sam Smith does have some recent stuff. Now, Sam Smith, they've gone into this like pop era, which by the way is great. But I really love The Thrill of It All. Like The Thrill of It All from 2017 is just such a good album. Like it is, if y'all want to listen to some like great, sad music, <laughs> I really recommend The Thrill of It All. It's so good. Yeah, I I loved that album. I, I think I I preferred that album to in the in the lonely hour and yeah my my apologies for uh, for tripping up on on his pronouns there oh, on, I, on their pronouns there. For, on their pronouns sorry well i think that i was just talking to my partner um ezra last night about uh they them pronouns and they, and they can be difficult they their pronouns can be difficult um mm. and i certainly don't you know I, i'm not gonna um i'm not into public shaming like game of thrones i'm not gonna drag you out to the street and shame um, but I think that the fact that you're showing the concerted effort is um, remarkable. Well, n I mean, not at all. Like, I, I think that this, uh, the fact that this has even become a debate is just a bit odd. It's a bit like the mask issue in, in the sense that if someone is displaying 
you know, is clearly upset and, 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 and emotional when people are, are getting it wrong. And, yeah. and, and they want to, to be addressed by a certain prone, pronoun. And it, and it kind of like, it doesn't cost anyone anything to go to, to do it, you know? And, and, and it's actually, it's, it's affecting their, their sense of self and their identity. Well, I, time I, you're preaching to the choir. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, sure, I, I'm, sure, I'm sure I am, but you know, I, like yeah. people debate about this all the time. Um, and and I, I'm, I'm unsure as to why, because it's just, doesn't help anyone's life to just like refuse to do some some kind of simple yeah thing. it's a pretty it's a pretty weird debate Wait, I have to ask, where, where are you from where's your accent from I, I'm in the UK so I'm from uh, I'm originally from London and uh, we are recording this I'm at uh, in Cambridgeshire in... is this a London accent uh no I suppose my accent is a mixture of uh I guess it's a posh English accent. Uh, so. Yeah, because it doesn't sound because like when I think London, I think maybe a little bit uh, less posh than um, than I your accent. I try not to be too. I try not to be too posh because it's uh, <laughs> you know it's it's a bit uh, like our prime minister is is a is an Eton boy, and and uh, what does that mean? It means that you went to a posh public school, which was attended by the um, the princes also attended it. And you mean Boris. And, and Boris attended it, and like Prince Harry and William, uh, oh. they went there. And basically, I went there as well. I've got a posh, posh background, but a lot of people think that you went to the like, same school as the prince. I did. I'm not boasting. That's actually a, a source of great shame. Uh, oh my! Well, it seems prestigious. That sounds like so prestigious. It's not prestigious though. In in in, I feel like in modern culture. It's, I mean, obviously it's a huge advantage to get a great education and I'm very lucky and any pitfalls of that, you know, whatever, like I'm very, very, very lucky and there's no getting around that. But, uh, you know, a kind of illustration of, of like people understandably thinking that everybody who went to Eton is a bit of a dick. Um, Got it. Uh, like, you, I, have, you have a lot more cultural context for Eton than I do. Yeah, I just yeah. found out about it about two minutes ago. <laughs> exactly, and it's not—it's not very. It's—it's—it's it's, it's not exactly. Uh, it's not exactly a big deal, you know. If you're not a dick, then hopefully people people. But also, that. why does Boris look like that? Like, why does he look so disheveled? I don't know. I mean, at, th at, at this point, it's got to. It feels like it's got to be a deliberate thing, right? Because you know, he could get any stylist or any anybody to like smarten him up. Right. It looks like he always just looks like someone just kind of like roughed him up and kind of shook him and like messed up his hair and then shoved him in front of a camera. That's how he always looks. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm not a big, a big fan of, uh, of, of Boris's, but I guess n fewer and fewer people are these days. Like the people who voted for him uh, are getting frustrated because of uh, the pandemic. Oh. And then we have something like that in America. <laughs> Uh, we have a very this is great. We have a very similar situation here in these United States. Um, you know, in terms of Boris's like disheveled look, it's actually it all depends on your personality too. Because like uh, Bernie Sanders has that same look. Bernie Sanders always looks a little disheveled. His suits are always just a little too big, and and he just kind of has the look of someone who is always a little bit in a bit of a rush. And he and he has that. New York accent that says like, I'm in a bit of a rush. I have a lot of things to do and I just want to get the information here in front of the people who need it. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I, I don't know. I've, I've always been really intrigued by the way, like people and their appearance and what they do um, with that. And I'm sorry, I, I completely derailed this interview. I have a tendency well, I, to do that. I, I, I'm really enjoying the tangent at the tangent. Well, my last question is this, are you cold? <laughs> like, are you outside? Well, I'm in a jacket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, it's because the heating here has broken down, sadly, and it is absolutely freezing. At uh, Eaton? Not, we're not at Eaton anymore. <laughs> I'm, kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I mean... <laughs> I'm just that kidding. was 12 years ago, thankfully. <laughs> uh, 12 years ago, thankfully, I left that place. But I, I, I was once working on a project, and, uh, and, and the person engineering the project had a notebook, um, and, and I, the, the title of the notebook on the outside of the notebook, it said something like list of nice old Etonians or 
list of nice people who went to Eton or something. And obviously the joke being that the notebook is like completely empty. Oh, it's empty. Oh. <laughs> and and, and, and so when I saw it, I was like, I should probably flag at this point where I went to school. <laughs> and, uh, or, you, or, you got, or you got to get in that book. Yeah, you have to be the exactly. first entry in the book. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> I mean, there are like the prestigious schools. I mean, I would say probably the most prestigious school in the United States is probably Harvard. Mm. Um, like if you tell people you go to Harvard, everyone's like, oh my God. And there are very few negative connotations for going to Harvard, except maybe people will just be like, oh, you probably grew up really privileged. That's probably the main um, thing that people would think, well, you went to Harvard, you must have really, which right. might not be true for everyone because I mean, I've never gone to Harvard. I, I got to come to a, a crummy four-year college. So I'm, I'm well, you know, ready to go to state school. Well, it hasn't, it hasn't affected your levels of success whatsoever. And I also didn't finish. Maybe it was because I left a little early and decided to do my own thing. <laughs> yeah, yes, it can. I mean, education can often be like really stifling. I mean, obviously Harvard is, is um, people would probably feel like people are less like stuffy and privileged when they go to Harvard because Harvard's like a uni. Whereas uh, like Eton is like 13 to 18 and Harvard is, it's Harvard. Oh, it's a, oh, it's a high school. Yeah, it's like a high, yeah, it's like a high school. Yeah. Oh, okay. I, I don't know about any, we don't have any famous high schools in America. There are no famous high, I can't think of a single, high school that, I mean, maybe maybe in the world of academia and like private school, I went to a public school. So I'm, I'm sure that uh, in the world of uh, academia, there are lots of um, private schools that have um, a lot of pre prestige to them that are quite prestigious. Um, but yeah, I, have, I, I, hadn't, I didn't realize that it was a private school. Yeah, I mean, or a high school. I mean, you don't call them high schools now. Yeah, it's a high. It's a high school. It's a boarding school, so you can't. You, you can't. You can't leave. Basically, do you uh, call them high schools there? No, it's actually called a public school, even though it's literally the reverse of a public school. In England, they call public schools. They call private schools public schools. I'm. I have no idea why. It originates from some. I, d I don't know. <laughs> it doesn't even make sense. Literally makes no sense at all. And they call public schools state schools, which I guess they is that an alternate word that you can use in the US as well for public school? No, a, a state. Okay, so a state school. You mean like in in terms of high school? Yeah, yeah. No, you would just say public school. There's no other word. A state school in the states is a college that is um, not a private college. For example, Harvard is a private school. Uh, Columbus State University, where I went as a state school. So it's a college, it's, it's just a four year college, but it's like Georgia State or Florida State, those are all state schools. And, and, and places like Harvard, like even for people who are incredibly privileged and stuff like those, those colleges to go to are extortionally expensive, aren't they? They're like ridiculously expensive. Listen, I believe that, I personally believe that higher education, at least in America, I can't speak for the world, but in America, higher education is the second largest scam in the history of America. It's insane how much it costs to go to college and the amount of money, money that you'll, like there's nothing else in the world where you'll go to school, pay over a hundred thousand dollars or something. And then they'll be like, by the way, we don't promise you'll ever get this back. Yeah, especially yeah. especially for arts. If you go to school for the arts, they're all, they're like, I can almost guarantee you'll never get this money back. <laughs> like you will never. How how yeah how how could you in 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 a way, because yeah, also because now education, hopefully the fact that the in you know you can learn a, a lot online for free. Like, I mean, obviously there's still huge inequality in terms of the education and starts that people are, are getting and not to mention the fact that a lot of people don't even have internet access so yeah that is it, it's it's not like the internet has eradicated all problems by any stretch of the imagination um, well when i was in school too i went to school i went to college because um i was part of the the america where they were like you have to go to college you have to like yeah. they really told us that like if you don't go to college you will be a bum so I went to college, but I wanted to be a, an actor or an entertainer. So I went to school for theater education, but I didn't really want to be a teacher. I did education because I was afraid that if, if it didn't work out, I need something to fall back on. Cause they also tell you that. They tell you your dreams won't work and that you need a backup plan. They always tell you that. So I ended up going to college for something that I didn't really want to go to, which was education. 
Um, and I went, even though I couldn't afford it, I could not afford it. I did not have the money for it. And I went anyway, <laughs> which sounds so wild to me. Yeah, yeah, but, but it used to be like the case that it was, oh, well, at least for certain sections of, of, of populations of society, it used to be like, oh, you're not gonna go to college, like as if it, it's, you know, this is a crucial stepping stone in, in your life, like professionally. Yeah, uh, yeah. Do you think that's changing? Yes, and, and honestly, yes. Now people are saying that the, 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 the like the, the, what's important about things like trade schools and like, um, so people who are self-starting. And it's so interesting too, even though there are people like uh, Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg who were extremely successful, albeit some of, um, and some of who, who were both notably college dropouts at one point in their life before they made their first million. They, I mean, they, they made their first million before they got their college degrees. Um, but even though we had those success stories, they were like, but that's one in a million, like, that doesn't happen. But it doesn't talk about the, the, the ingenuity of what you can learn outside of school and also i mean i don't know about y'all over there but here in america our education system is so odd like we don't learn like i'm going through this issue with my tax guy right now i'm learning how to like pay my taxes because i never learned that in school and that's something that but i but i know trigonometry <laughs> but i know the quadratic equation which doesn't make any sense um and i i have never used the pythagorean theorem in life i've never used it not even one time but yeah. I've needed to know how to do my taxes for the past 16 years, and I have not known. I've just hired someone to do it. Even when I didn't have any money, I was still hiring people to do my taxes because you know, you get a, you get a, do you guys get tax returns there? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you get a, you, you overpay your taxes all year long, and at the end of the year, someone who's good at numbers will do all the numbers for you and tell you how much money you get back, and then you pay them to do that. So then you're losing some money so that they can do that for you. And I've been doing that since I was 18 years old, which is wild. I don't know how to do my taxes. I'm 34 years old. I'm a business owner. <laughs> I don't know how to do my taxes. Well, we, we're never taught. It's weird that that stuff isn't, and there are probably more examples as well of kind of practical things that everybody yeah. needs to know. Well, I do remember in school them teaching me how to balance a checkbook and we don't use checkbooks anymore. <laughs> so I do I have vivid memories of being taught how to balance my checkbook. I mean, my, my mom may have done that. I don't even know if that was in school or not, but I, but now we don't balance checkbooks anymore because everything's digital. Yeah, it, to a certain extent, is, is education becoming even harder given the accelerated pace at which the world is changing? Like it's changing ridiculously fast and it looks like it's gonna change even even faster so how can we educate people in a way that's gonna like be relevant in the future i mean that's a good question i dropped out of the education program so i don't know <laughs> i don't i don't even have the beginnings but i mean i think it's important to realize that a lot of people need like different people need different things everyone does not learn the same people people are seeing that now. everyone does not learn the same so you, and also i went to i went to school in uh, public school in atlanta so we had really large classrooms like I had classes with 40 people in it, you know, which is, I'm, I found out later in life, that's a lot of people. I didn't know that was a lot of people. That's like a lecture at uni or something. It's like, yeah, 40, I had classes with 40 people in my, and I had on average, my class had about like 30 to 30, 34 people in them, but I had some classes that had 40. It was, they were huge classes. I mean, my school was overrun. We had a trailer park. We had to attach a trailer park to the school because the trailers were classrooms because we ran out of classes in the building. My God. And at one point in the, in the 90s, they had to add a vocational building. So my school started one building. They built an entirely new building because the, the building was overrun. And then they had to add a trailer park because they didn't have enough money to buy a new building, but they still needed about 20 more classes. God. And have, have, have things improved, you know, in... in, in... In the, at Morrow High School, I've not been to Morrow High School in, uh, but in, in the US, seventeen years. I was I've been there in seventeen years, so I don't know how things are doing <laughs> at Morrow High School. It's almost been two decades. In three years, I'll be at my twenty-year reunion. That is so insane to me. <laughs> well, I'm sure I'm sure they'd be uh, very pleased pleased to see you if you return. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what high school you think I went to. I was watching an episode of uh, what's that uh, Queer Eye. 
where Jonathan Van Ness went back to his high school and everyone like loved, everyone's like, oh my God, Jonathan. And I just feel like if I went back to my high school, I would get hate crime and called a faggot and like run out of the school. That probably wouldn't happen. And maybe I'm not giving enough credit to the students of our high school, but I know when I was going there, uh, that was the that was that was the experience for sure. So I mean, I, I also went to like a uh, not inner city. It's inner city is, is a hard term in Atlanta because Atlanta is actually a very small city. You don't realize Atlanta's population is actually about like three hundred and fifty thousand people. There's not that many people who live in Atlanta. Most people live in the suburbs. So the greater Atlanta area has six million people. So about five million and a half people live in the suburbs of Atlanta, and that's where I'm from. Right, right, and and so so the the, the actual center of the city is not not particularly densely populated. Populated? No, it's not. No, no, no. That's interesting. I've only been to Atlanta once. Um, I've been to all 48 U.S. states before. Uh, so oh, the con- you haven't been to Alaska and Hawaii yet? I've been to Hawaii. I've got one left, Alaska. Alaska. So you, so you, we said 48. It's, we have 50. Well, 48 contiguous, I went. Uh, I, I, that, was, that was the kind of challenge uh, to do. To Wait, go. so Alaska's the one you have? So you've been to 49? Yeah, the, the whole, when I went to Hawaii, that was like separate the, the, in the sense that it was like a different trip. I did this trip like in 2019 where I went to every single contiguous. Why? Um, what were you doing in South Dakota? It was just a challenge to go to every every single state. I, I was promoting a music project, but also I just kind of wanted to see all of America. I mean, Tom, that. there are people who live in North Dakota who don't go to South Dakota. <laughs> like <laughs> there are people who live in North who have never been to South Dakota. I mean, but I've been I've been to South Dakota before, but like, oh, why would you go to South Dakota? It's so wild to me. I've been to every state except Maine. Every every city apart from Maine. Every state except Every for state Maine. Apart from Maine. Um, yeah. How come not Maine? Well, Maine is just one of those places you don't you don't drive by. You can't drive by because Maine, for those of you who are not American, if you're looking at my hand, Maine is like my pointer finger, like the nail of my pointer finger. Like you can drive around everything else, but you really have to go out of your way to get to Maine. Also, it's flipped this that way. So Maine's on the West Coast, East Coast, I mean. So you really have to go out of your way to get to Maine. Like you, you, you don't drive through Maine. You literally have to be aiming for me. So I've never gotten a gig there. I don't have any family or friends there. I'd have to be wanting to vacation in Maine. And I'm not really the vacation type. You're not the vacation type in general? No, I've never taken a vacation. How come? Too much work to do? Well, I don't know. I, I just didn't have them growing up, so it's not part of my life. I, I, I never, we never went on like a cruise as a kid or like, I mean, the, the only thing I've done, every summer I go to Mississippi to visit my family for the summer. That was my vacation, I guess. But I've never gone to like a hotel. I don't know that I ever even stayed in a hotel as a child. Like I don't, I think as a kid, I never spent a night in a hotel room. You never spent a, a night in a hotel room? As, as Not as a child, no. Oh, yeah. Well, we didn't have enough money, so we, hotels are expensive. So if you travel, you have to be like staying with someone. Yeah, for sure you do. I mean, that, that, I, that is, pretty normal you know yeah even even coming from a, an upbringing of privilege it's not like uh you know we didn't we weren't in hotels particularly that that much you know uh, yeah yeah that's like, that's like a that's like a treat to go and to go and stay in a hotel uh and uh even even now you know making my own my own money like the uh the the trip the 48 trip round 48 state trip around the u.s um i stayed in a, in a lot of uh lovely motels which was Kind of felt pretty glamorous despite not actually being very glamorous <laughs> also, american feels glamorous i mean i don't know to an american you're probably I mean, staying in a motel doesn't feel glamorous staying in a hotel oh, feels a little bit more hotel glamorous. yeah obviously some of the motels were real dumps but i don't know yeah. everything american culture like you glorify it i mean these days less so because uh, of all, all the horrible violence and polarization that's that's going on um which you know it's it's awful to see but in 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 a general sense of pop culture like if you if you're british and watching tv all the time and, and, and america you kind of glorify it in your mind all the movies and all the all the pop stars and stuff i'm so intrigued by the way that people who aren't americans view america and it, it also interests me the way that we view um 
other cultures. For example, like um, the way that the British say Bianca, Bianca. <laughs> it sounds so fancy. Like if I heard of a woman named Bianca, I would assume she was like a duchess. But I've heard that over in the UK, Bianca is not a very posh name. It's actually the name of a relatively trashy character on a soap opera. So people associate the name Bianca with like trashy. And I'm like, oh my God, Bianca is such a glamorous name. Mm, I would say Bianca is quite, uh, I'd say it's, it's you, you get some people, who's, the, who's in the soap opera? Or is it? I don't know. They, they were like, there's some character named Bianca that everyone like, who's kind of trash, and they're like, oh, everyone knows Bianca. There's Bianca. There's a Bianca Jagger, or there's a Bianca. Like, is there a Bianca Gascoigne? There are some famous Biancas who maybe are kind of just like, kind of quite gossipy celebs. But uh, and I think about and I know. So there's a drag queen named Bianca Del Rio, and whenever we're in the UK, they're like, oh, we saw Bianca. Bianca's absolutely lovely. She's amazing, and I'm like. I'm like, who the fuck is B? <laughs> who the fuck is Bianca? I always think to myself, who are you guys talking about? Oh, Bianca. Have we seen Bianca over at um? I'm like, oh, work. <laughs> yeah, but the thing is, right, is that if you were to say Bianca here, in it, people would be like, why are you pronouncing it like that? And they'd think that you were being a bit, you know, a bit of a ponce. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> if you would, because if you say it Bianca. But they'd be they'd be thinking that's more normal. I think that's less posh. If I, they, you know, people would think you're very posh if you were to go. Oh, I saw Bianca the other day. <laughs> if my word, we've seen Bianca down in Bridgerton in <laughs> Yorkshire, the Duchess of Higglesbury. She was looking rather rather sick. It was quite scandalous. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> So it's Does like, anyone really talk like that? Is there really anyone in the UK who's like, my word, I found her rather common, but I thought her, her pedigree was certainly not up to code. With, like, is there anyone who actually speaks that way? There are, there are. Yeah. I'm obsessed. I want to meet, if you have any aunts who talk like that, please send me videos because that sounds, that's just so exciting to hear someone talking uh, with like a really specific UK accent. Like if someone has like a thick Scottish accent or someone has like a, um, what's the really common one that everyone makes fun of? It's like, all right, Mike, get, what's that one? Is that Cockney? Cockney, yeah. Someone has like a thick Cockney accent or like the way Adele sounds. <laughs> like she sounds so, I love her accent. And everyone says she sounds so common. I'm like, I love it. Yeah, she's got a great accent, and she's uh, she's an amazing. You you mentioned you were you were listening to to her stuff. She's such a great singer and such a great artist. And oh, she's brilliant! Three. Brilliant. She's my she's my most listened to artist of uh, twenty twenty. Really, really, yeah. Because she because has she released any new music as well? Narlov, as they say in Australia, Nar. She's not releasing any new music because she was supposed to be performing new music on SNL when she came to the states to do SNL, but she she was like, sorry, I'm actually gonna be the host and not the musical guest because I don't have any music ready. That's cool. She did a good job though hosting, did did she not or did she? Yeah, she did a pretty good job. Yeah, she did a pretty good job. She's, uh, she's a very interesting in the sense of releasing, I think it's been only three albums, but to have, they're just, they're just so good and her performance and her vocals and everything are so good that she is literally the most successful artist of the last 10 years, probably. You know, she is the second least controversial artist of all time. There's like, there's like a chart that people list, like who's controversial. Adele is the second least controversial artist of all time. Do you want to guess who number one is? Paul McCartney? Dolly Parton. Oh uh, yeah, that is a good it's one. It's one of the things where like people, like everyone likes Adele, like conservatives, liberals, um, what do you call them? Tories. <laughs> like everyone likes Adele and the same with Dolly Parton. Like there's like everyone likes Dolly Parton. Yeah, that's it. That's because because she was actually in the um, in the papers here. She was she was in like the magazine attached to the paper and there was a big interview with her. And she was talking about her unwillingness to comment on politics because she sees her role as an entertainer. Um, and is, do you think that's the reason why she's so so uncontroversial? Because she's kind of just stayed out of politics. 
Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I do. And I, and I don't necessarily uh, buy the story that she's like, oh, I just don't come in a positive because I'm supposed to be an entertainer. Well, bitch, we're all entertainers. Like, you, Adele knows damn well that you can be an entertainer and be political. Mm-hmm. I think that Adele also knows that she has a bigger appeal if she doesn't um, side with anyone. Like, I think Adele knows that. And I think that to insinuate that Adele in her 30s isn't aware that if she remains apolitical, she's able to uh, reach more people. And maybe her idea instead of like, um, maybe her goal in life is to reach more people than it is to, um, you know, exact some sort of political change. Because, you know, like um, speaking of uh, controversial Paul McCartney and John Lennon, they really uh, wrecked a lot of their fan base by coming out political, by coming out against the war. Um, and it really ruptured their fan base when the Beatles were like splitting up and stuff. Um, and I think that, uh, and I think the same for Dolly Parton. Like there's a famous video of Dolly Parton on stage with Lily, Lily Tomlin and Jane Fonda at the nine, nine to five, re, uh, like it was like the nine to five, 20, 30 year anniversary or something. They were at the Oscars or the Grammys and Jane Fonda and Lily Tomlin were like going in on Trump and Dolly Parton was just in the middle, like, oh my God, oh my, but she didn't know they were going to do that. She was just like, oh, ooh. I, um, because she didn't want to say anything political. But there's also comes a point where, like, if you have a, it's not anyone's job to be political. You don't have to do that. But there also comes a point where you think to yourself, a lot of people in America knew that Donald Trump was dangerous before he uh, incited a riot at the Capitol building. Like, a lot of us were aware. And then a lot of people knew it, but just chose not to say anything. Now, there are people like Beyonce and Taylor Swift who chose to be apolitical for a long time until they just couldn't anymore. And then one day Beyonce was like, I can't be apolitical. I have to be political now. And she did that. And the same with um, same with uh, Taylor Swift. She went apolitical for a really long time. And then one day she was like, I got to say something. Yeah, yeah. It's, it seems like it has reached that point. Do you think it has reached that point now where if you, you're sort of, your silence is, is the expression silence is complicit or, or something like that, you know? Well, the term we use, the term we use in the activist circle of silence is violence. I mean, if, if you are, if you are in, uh, let's make it, let's make it small. Let's make it a microcosm. If you're in a restaurant and your friend is being mean to the waiter, and I mean, just nasty, calling them racial epithets, calling them a faggot, calling them a piece of shit, and you just don't say anything, at what point are you implicit? I think from the word go, really, you know, I mean, definitely, you know, be like, what are you doing? Uh, or probably, I mean, if someone started doing that, you'd, I think you'd quickly get riled up to the point of literally just like feeling like hitting them in the face if someone was being that rude. Yeah. Know? And, and that is what Donald Trump is doing in America. That's what he's doing. It's nothing short of that. That is worse than that. It is what Donald Trump has done in America is worse than um being mean to your waiter because if you're mean to your waiter a a riot won't happen on capitol hill (laughs) you know what i mean maybe maybe there'll be a complaint to the to the uh maybe uh the manager will ask you to leave the building that's the end of the story in terms of um people being complacent and letting bullies have their way and again i want to reiterate it is not adele's job to (laughs) call out Boris Johnson or to call out Donald Trump or even retrospectively call out Mussolini. That is not Adele's job to do. But I do think that when you have a lot of eyes and ears on you, you could, you could help a lot. Now, in inverse, Adele is helping a lot through her music. Like Adele reaching people through her music, that does help people. There's no, there's no denying that that helps people. You know what I mean? What Adele has done for people who are who are not skinny, I mean, she's skinny now, but at the beginning of her, she was fat, she was a big girl, and to see someone that size, like being so loved, so popular, so talented, and universally, I mean genuinely, globally loved, everyone in the fucking world, if you go to the corners of Indonesia or to the top of uh, Big Ben and whisper the name Adele, people will know who you're talking about. Mm. You know yeah. what I mean? And yeah. I do think she's had an impact in that regard as well. So I guess you have to just weigh the odds. Do you want, what What do you want to, what are you willing to risk to stand up for something else? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I guess Dolly Parton maybe 
she started her career at a time I mean, there were obviously many political artists, as you just said, you know, Lennon in particular, very political from the Beatles. Um, people have a sense that like Bob Dylan was like super political, but he wasn't like, he, he wrote songs that meant a lot to people politically, but he wasn't that, that outspoken. Yeah, he didn't, he didn't write Fuck the Police by N.W.A. Exactly. You know what I mean? He didn't kind of make his stance like that known. It was more like shrouded in, in in, in metaphor but so Dolly Parton is part of the thing with her that she's like a country artist and they like they have like a well the country play. music is um country music is leans conservative let's put it that way so is that is that what is that why she would kind of say nothing because she probably she's probably like a democrat voter who but who's just like has a big Republican fan base. Well, I mean, that's just conjecture. We have no clue. She might not be a Democrat. She might have voted for Trump. Well, she's a she might be a fuck. Yeah, and, and, and she has a lot of, she also has a lot of liberal fans. Like all gays love Dolly Parton. Every gay, every queer, all the queers love Dolly Parton. Everyone loves Dolly Parton. You know what I mean? Yeah. And maybe she's like, I don't want to let down these people. I don't want to let down the, I don't want to let down anyone. She doesn't want to let anyone down. Maybe that's what it is. I'm, this is all conjecture. I have no clue. Dolly Parton might have, might, there's a chance Dolly Parton has not voted in her 70 years on this earth. That's a possibility too. You, you know what I'm saying? Um, I have a feeling she has voted. Um, but I think that, you know, there, there, there have been instances of people in the country scene coming out against conservative politicians and it really ruining their career. Like for example, the Dixie Chicks came out against George Bush and it ruined their careers. Why was that? Because all their fans voted for George Bush. Well, they, they, they were, yeah, because they were a country act. Yeah, they came over the shirts that said F U G B. It said fuck you, George Bush on the shirt. Or it stood for fuck you, George Bush. Um, and the the their fans did not like that. Yeah, yeah. I remember them uh, well, actually I don't remember them being cancelled, but I've since read up on it. Um, well, how old are you? I'm 30. Oh, okay. But I, I, I just heard about it on this podcast. And now, of course, they've changed their name to The Chicks, I think, because of the- Oh, they left, they left the Dixie behind? Well, yeah. you know, because well, I don't know if you know this, but there's a lot of negative connotations to the term Dixie. Yeah, is there kind of Confederate connotations there? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, but, but with Bolly, Dolly Parton, rather, uh, does, does that, does that um, you know, the fact that she doesn't make her opinion known either way, arguably to kind of um, keep uh, a Republican fan base there. Does, does that annoy you and, 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 and like uh, damage your reputation of, of people in the entertainment business when they, when they don't um, express their views politically? Does that compromise your enjoyment of their, their art and their work? Well, again, I'll say this. I don't know if that's why Gally Parton and Adele are not uh, say they're, I don't know why they don't say their political beliefs. Uh, all, I, and no, it doesn't. I mean, again, Adele is still my most listened to artist of 2020. Yeah. Like, I, I love Set Fire to the Rain. I love, you know, Water Under the Bridge. I know every word to, you know, all I ask. So it, it, it does not stop me from listening to their music, but it, I always have in my mind, what if Adele had come out and said, what Boris Johnson is doing in regards to the vaccine is not okay. Imagine the impact. Imagine the impact. Yeah. So, so do you do you have a preference of people in show business to use their platforms for good where, where, where possible? Mm, maybe. I mean, maybe. I mean, again, still a delta number to listen to artists of twenty twenty. Yeah. So, so it but I also listen to. It. Yeah, but, but I still listen to, like, I mean, I, I, I love Beyonce's political work. I love Taylor Swift's political work. I love um, NWA's political work. I love, I, I love that stuff. Like, I love that, too. I mean, I have a pretty wide palette in terms of what I appreciate with uh, music. You know what I mean? It's just always, it's just always in the back of my mind, that's all. It's just always in the back of my mind. You, has that increased as, as the last five, ten years have gone by? You know what it's like? It's like meeting someone from Eden. They might not be an asshole, but it's always in the back of your mind they might be. <laughs> that is what it's like. It's like you meet someone, you're like, wow, he seems to love Tom seems like a lovely guy. But he is from Eden. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just like, it's like, 
if people don't make their opinion known, it's at, at a certain point, especially if you're meeting people like socially, would you say that, you know, after a while, if they haven't said like, okay, you know, Trump's an asshole or, 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 or you know, this is my opinion about this matter politically, or at least given some kind of indication as to where their political beliefs stand, you sort of have in the back of your mind, well, I'm not actually sure, like, are you, you know, a good person? Yeah, so, and I don't believe that Trump supporters are bad people. I think that a lot of Trump supporters are misguided. I think that a lot of times we forget how easy it is for people to become radicalized. If you're fed over and over again by every, like everywhere around you that the ballots are a lie, like I'm not religious, okay? But we're told so often that everything in the Bible is real. And I don't know if you're religious, I'm not here to offend you. None of it makes sense. None of what they say, not a, there is practically nothing from the eating, from a fish eating someone and them surviving and being thrown in a lion's den, the lion does nothing. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego get thrown in the fire, they never get burned. Um, people turning into pillars of salt, uh, cripples walking, blind people seeing, lepers living and being cured. None of that makes sense, but you're told that stuff so often that people believe it's true and they believe that all of it happened. So if someone can believe that a guy was murdered by a mob of people and then rose from the dead three days later, of course they can believe that a couple of ballots were, um, were messed with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is a very, very good point. And, uh, and on top of that, it's sort of like, so religion obviously is, is, is a bit like the cult of personality. It's, it's giving people who have nothing some kind of hope that that's the role that religion has traditionally served in, you know, pe people have looked to this, to this God character and, and, uh, you know, for, for better or for worse, uh, they, and, and so Trump in that sense, it feels like he's filled, um, that void for some people, for the more ardent of his supporters, uh, a lot of whom may have very little, they, you know, in, in like the Rust Belt and stuff from from what I've I've read, um, they they may just it may just be like replacing religion, this like completely baseless accusations of electoral fraud. Like no matter what he says, they'll just lap it up. Yeah. I mean think about think about the someone of it tweet, I'm so sick of living through historical events. Like I'm sick of it. I've lived through a there's in my tiny little 34 years in this Earth, there are so many things that are history. And I'm, I've had enough of being part of history. I was there when the Challenger exploded. I was there on 9-11. I was there at the insurrection. I was there when the president got banned off of every social media platform. <laughs> Donald Trump can't even go on Shopify. <laughs> Donald Trump can't even use Pinterest. I mean, do you I... see how wild that is? Imagine, did you ever think that you'd hear like Barack Obama banned from Twitter? It's, it's, it's um, like before this, it was literally like kind of nut jobs, you know? And I don't know if you remember this, but a while back in America, Donald Trump tried to ban TikTok. He tried to ban TikTok from America. And someone was finding it funny that TikTok banned Donald Trump before he could ban, before he could ban TikTok. Well, uh, you know, it, it, even, I think that the idea of a Donald Trump TikTok is 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 pretty horrifying. Um, to to uh, no matter no matter even if you're a, um, even if you are a Trump supporter, it would be horrifying. Let alone yes, uh, lots of amazing things. Um, bust down, Tatiana. I want to see you bust down. I'm like it's like Donald Trump trying to engage. Uh, tell me you're a conservative, but not actually telling me you're a conservative. Be awful. Oh. Yeah. Uh, th do you think that the way it has been, do you think that they did the right thing in um, in, in kicking him off for, um, in terms of, you know, if their intention was to, su to silence him or to, um, or to kind of uh, stop violence in the long run, do you think it will? It will... Well, I do think they did the right thing because he, by the way, is, this is not about silencing Donald Trump and, um, you know, it's about he broke the community guidelines. You cannot encourage people to be violent on Twitter. 
That's against the rules. Oh, of course. Now, the same rules that I, Bob the Drag Queen, and my mom, Martha Caldwell, and you, Tom Cribblin, Donald Trump have to follow the same rules. In fact, more so, because he has a wider reach than we do. Do you think that this will, will have been a great way of dealing with it and kind of hopefully bringing the country together and seeing the end, end of... of, of yeah, country? well, here's why. Twitter is a really big player in American politics. Twitter is huge in American politics. And um, Jack, the guy who's over at Twitter, Whenever Twitter does something, I think that Twitter banning Donald Trump gave all the other platforms, the other um, operating systems, permission to do it as well. They're like, okay, well, if Twitter can do it, we can do it. And it also go goes to show, because now, so this is how it works. So we have something called the 25th Amendment. The 25th Amendment says that a president can be removed from office if they are a danger to the country. But the vice president has to invoke that. The vice president has to be the one to do it. Mike Pence doesn't want to do it, even though he does, even though Mike Pence, our vice president, no longer supports Donald Trump, which is insane. That is insane. Listen to how crazy this, these sentences sound. He doesn't want to do that. He's still holding on. But what happens is now we have another impeachment. Donald Trump will be the only president who's been impeached twice. The only U.S. president to be impeached two times in one term. And once he, if he is impeached this next time, what will happen is that means he can never run for political office ever again in the United States. Yeah. Do you think they'll manage to do it in time? Well, that's the thing. You don't have, you don't actually have to impeach before you, the impeachment can happen after there's no, the, the statute of limitations for impeachment is not during your term. All right. Okay. That's yeah. interesting. So it, it could well succeed. They're trying to get him out of office just to make sure that he doesn't do things that he has authority to do. Like he has the nuclear codes. He, he tells the Pentagon, like there's, there's, there's a le allegation that the reason why the National Guard, the military, was so late to get to the cap Capitol Hill is because Donald Trump did not clear the Pentagon to send in the National Guard. God, I, will. I mean, you saw the video. He called them um, special. You're very special. Go home. Get some rest. You're very, mm -hmm. you, I love you, baby. Mm -hmm. You're special. I like what you did with that lectern. Really funny in Nancy Pelosi's office. Like he was talking to them like they were a toddler who's throwing a hissy fit. And they're not toddlers. There are full grown adults with weapons who beat a police officer to death with a fire extinguisher. Yeah. yeah. And they're the same people who were like, back the blue, back the blue. You beat a police officer to death. With a fire extinguisher to death, yeah. trampled them. So yeah. obviously they're dangerous. Clearly, I mean, there was a woman named Ashley Babbitt. I don't know. Everyone knows her name now. She was climbing through the window. I don't know if it's in the video. This woman was fed lies, and she gave her life for a lie that she believed. She gave her life because she had been radicalized. Donald Trump and uh, Mitch McConnell and Ted Cruz and Lindsey Graham and Ann Coulter and Mike Pence and all those people lied to her told, and Rudy Giuliani told her that she was a patriot. They told her that she that her vote had been stolen and the election was stolen. They, they said it so many times that whipped her into a frenzy. She believed it. And then she breached the last line of defense between her and the vice president. So that's what people, I don't know if people in London know this. What happened, when Ashley Babbitt got shot, what happened was there was nothing between her, Ashley Babbitt, and Mike Pence and Kamala Harris, who are the vice president and the vice president-elect, and the senators. So it wasn't the cops did not kill her, it was secret services that killed her. Um, because there was another option. They also did not show the video of the police officers moving out of the way so she could do it. They were standing there, not doing anything, kind of just like hanging out. And then they moved out of the way after being coerced by the crowd to just move. They just left. And we saw during the Black, Black Lives Matter um, protests that they, like, if, if a Black person or a Black Lives Matter supporter breathed on the cop the wrong way, you were going to get beat, beat and tear gassed. It is very, very um, just horrendous and, 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 mystifying how it was even allowed to take place that the, the difference in the way that it was handled you know on on january the 6th versus you know there was a huge 
presence from like police and military and the photo yeah. so different like during during the but also tom only white people are shocked only white black people are not shocked people of color indigenous people in america are sure as hell not shocked after they were trying to protect their land against this pipeline and and were beat for that so people of color are like oh yeah this seems like another fucking tuesday well, that, you know that's just horrible um and, and or even if you look at the way that the proud boys were at the uh at, in um charlottesville they were marching down the street with fire with tiki torches which is so weird that they went to fucking hobby lobby and they all bought tiki torches they're walking down the street with fire like the fucking ku klux klan and then the president goes there were very good people on both sides it's like okay you're dangerous yeah yeah, that that was as far back as when was that? That was almost four years ago. Yeah, it yeah. was so long ago, and it's like we've been telling y'all this whole time. Let me see when. Okay, Google, when was Charlottesville? These came back from a search. It was in 2017. Mm. Yeah, the Unite the Right rally they called it. Here and here we are now. So, do you have any, or do you have a positive view of what the future looks like, or, or, or a kind of hope for what the future looks like for America now? I do. Biden, I do. Coming in, um, and how do you think? How do you think things are going to get better? And, and you know, when do you think things are going to get better? Well, I do have hope because um, I do think that democracy won in this case despite attempts at our president to try to undermine democracy at basically every avenue. Um, it did not work. The, the senator still got on the floor and confirmed the um, confirmed that Joe Biden will be inaugurated on the 20th, that, that will be Donald Trump's last day at work. Um, and democracy has not slowed at all. In fact, if anything, it got a huge boost this year because people are so upset and so sick of the bullshit. Mm. You know what I mean? And that's why, I mean, not to make it, not to bring it all back, but like the, and a big part of this is like, you know, mu music, musical artists coming out because they are the biggest celebrities in the world. Who is bigger than musicians, except maybe a couple of actors. And I mean, maybe. Like, yeah, Meryl Streep's big, but she ain't selling tickets like Beyonce. You, you know what I mean? And when these people come forward and, and use their voices to proclaim um, that they're not going to have stand for the bullshit anymore, it has a massive impact. Yeah. yeah. You know? It, re it, it really does. And uh, and it's very telling to see that, um, you know, you'd be hard pressed to find a, a single musician uh, voting for Trump. And the thing is, like, when people say, like, I just don't want to get to political, that's me being a deal. I just don't want to get political. You can't not be, I, I'm not, I'm just not political. That, that day is done. Because everything that you do, especially at that level, is engaged in politics. And everything that politicians do directly affects you. So you, being not, there is no, I'm not political. That's literally not an option. Yeah. You can choose not to speak on politics, but that does not mean that you do not have a life that is affected by politics. You know, being rich and famous does not put you above politics. Yeah, yeah, well, it shouldn't. Um, but I think people should really try and en engage um, as much as possible. And, you know, I, I definitely I definitely used to be pretty ignorant on politics. I used to just think it was boring because it wasn't music, honestly. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, it, the very sad truth of it is that it's not boring because it's so horrible that it's literally, it's horrifying. But it is, but politics, music is politics. I mean, listen to Ball of Confusion by The Temptations. Mm -hmm. uh, listen to Fuck Donald Trump by, what's that guy? There's this rapper who, who wrote a song called Fuck Donald Trump, which sounds like a silly song, but in the moment, that's how a lot of people felt. Yeah. Like, that's how they felt. They were like, this is by uh, John Lumi. Have you, have you heard this song before? I haven't heard it. Hold on. Do you hear this? <laughs> so it's the whole song.
song about fuck Donald Trump. Anyway, um, but it became like this like anthem for a lot of people. It's by John Lumi. I think it's his like big hit. It's like his hit. I quite, I, 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 he sounds a bit like Anderson Pack. His, his like voice sounded sounded a bit like Anderson Pack. It had that kind of like tone to it. Who's Anderson Pack? Who's Anderson Pack? Yeah, he's awesome. You should check out his music. It's really he's like he's what, what kind of music? He well, it's a sort of hybrid of like he does he does a bit of rap, but it's mostly like R and B. Uh, there's some soul in there. Ooh, and he's handsome. He he's yeah, he's got a great style. That is for sure. Uh, and and he 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 play he plays drums as well, um, whilst whilst singing, and but then he raps a bit. Like Dr. Dre has produced a great song of his, um, which he did with Kendrick called Tints. He's 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 oh. an amazing artist. He's like St Stevie Wonder of rap type of thing. I think nice, really really talented. Um, I'll check him out. Yes, you, you you please do. Bob, thank you so much for coming on the Greatest Music of All Time podcast. I've got one final question for you, which is, yes. what is the song that you've been most obsessed with recently? Recently, I've been listening most to is uh, Shots Fired by Megan Thee Stallion. It's a song about um, how Tory Lane shot her. Um, and it's really a good song. If you're enjoying the Greatest Music of All Time podcast, you can keep up to date with all of our latest episodes for free by subscribing. If you're watching on YouTube, the subscribe button is located at the top of the Tom Cridlin YouTube page. It's also at the bottom right of any video that you watch on YouTube. If you're listening on an audio platform, such as Spotify or Apple Podcasts, you can subscribe at the top of the page.